Hello and welcome to Prithvi Theatre. This is TIFR with Chai and Y. With us today is a guest, uh, Professor Gyan Bhanot, who is visiting TIFR. He is from Rutgers University where he works in molecular biology and physics. Gyan has a very diverse experience being trained in physics, moving over to biology via computer science. And today he will tell us about a very interesting topic, the selfish gene and the evolution of cooperation. Now I don't know what that means, so Gyan, what is, what is it all about? Uh, what it's all about is is uh, a di discussion that's been going on in in philosophy, anthropology, sociology for many many uh, hundreds of years. Which is what is the basis of our ethical system? Many people believe that ethics arises from kind of a self-imposed uh, system. It's a self-imposed system that humans have, but we also see cooperation in, an in animals, and so it's hard to 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 believe that animals have the same degree of ethics as us if we are special. Uh, so what I want to argue is that um, genes which are selfish and basically they, they are interested only in propagating themselves into the future um, force us into cooperative behavior uh, when we have to interact with other systems carrying similar genes. So uh, there is a different level of cooperation between people who are related to each other compared to people who are who are in the same community compared to going outside into nations and um, on a wider scale human beings themselves so i'm going to use arguments from game theory and biology to try to convince you of this and then we should have an interesting discussion sounds like fun let's watch gyan bhanot and chai and why thank you okay. so um i'm going to try to convince you of uh, something very simple um and um I would strongly recommend that all of you should read this book, which is, a, which is called The Origins of Virtue. Uh, it's by uh, Matt Ridley. So this is a book about human nature, and in particular, the surprising social role nature of the human animal. We live in towns, work in teams, and our lives are spider's web of connections, linking us to relatives, colleagues, companions, friends, superiors, and peers. It, is probably, it has probably been a million years since any human being was entirely and convincingly self-sufficient able to survive without trading his skills for those of his fellow humans. We are far more dependent on other members of our species than any other ape or monkey. Yet, to most people, instincts are animal things, not human. The conventional wisdom in the social sciences, and that's still true, actually. Most people, if you go to a social science colloquium or something, they'll still tell you that human nature is simply an imprint of an individual's background and experience. This is why, for example, we have the caste system. Uh, they are, they are canalized expressions of our instincts. And that is why the same themes crop up in all cultures, themes such as family, ritual, bargain, love, hierarchy, friendship, jealousy, group loyalty, and superstition. Uh, instincts, however, instincts in a species like the human one are not immutable genetic programs. They are predispositions to learn. So it is the claim of this book that the answer to an old question, how is society possible, is now at hand, thanks to the insights of evolutionary biology. And that has actually not made it yet to the textbook. So most people don't believe any of this because that's not what they are taught in school. And people, it's amazing to what extent our prejudices are limited to what we learn from when we are in, in school and what our parents tell us. This is why religion, in spite of the fact that it doesn't make any sense, is still very strongly uh, imposed on our systems. So society was not invented by reasoning men. It evolved as part of our nature. So it is as much a product of our genes as our bodies are. To understand it, we must look inside our brains at the instinct for creating and exploiting social bonds that are there. We must also look at other animals to see how the essentially competitive business of evolution can sometimes give rise to cooperative instincts. We must, so think about this. We must consider the fact that a billion year coagulation of our genes have created cooperative systems, not just us, but all the animals. And the million year co coagulation of our particular ancestors into cooperative societies and the thousand year co coagulation of ideas about society and, and its origins into the relationship networks that we live on. So this is basically the, the logic that I'm going to use. So this is from a series called Life, which is from David Attenborough. And some of you may have seen it. This is the coast of Florida. Here, strange scars on the seabed hint at one animal's remarkable strategy. Dolphins. 
These are bottlenose dolphins, one of the most intelligent animals on Earth. Their prey is very elusive, fast swimming fish. But the dolphins have invented a completely new way of hunting. By beating its tail down hard, this dolphin stirs up the shallow silt. And by swimming in a tight circle, it creates a ring of mushrooming mud around a shell of fish. see that it's not just us that cooperate. Okay, so um, I, I let me quickly go through my slides. So I, as you will probably have known if you pay attention, children always ask the best questions because they have no prejudice. And so, for example, people they ask, why are there people? <laughs> or what are we for? And what is, what is man? And the point I want to make here is that any Answer, any attempt to answer such a question before 19, 1859 are worthless. What happened in 19, 1859? Does anyone know? Yeah, Darwin wrote his, his, uh, his book, Origin of Species. Uh, and so it says, uh, any attempt to answer these questions before 1859 are worthless, and we should forget that, forget them completely. However, society hasn't caught up with them. But consider the following question. Let's say superior beings from Earth visited Earth, visited us, and want to assess the level of our civilization. What is the one question that they would ask? Have they discovered evolution yet? Because it's the most elusive thing. People, people knew a lot about how the planets move and you know, which, where's the center of the galaxy and so on. But they didn't, hadn't, we hadn't discovered evolution. So, <laughs> the key questions that I will address, why are we selfish and why do we cooperate? And the amazing thing is that these, these, the answers to these simple questions, which any child would ask, um, actually connect biology, sociology, anthropology, morality, ethics, behavioral psychology, business practices, politics, and also human family relationships, as I will show you. And the, but the bigger impact is, is this, is religion necessary for moral behavior? All religious people have always insisted, and this is true, that without religion we would we would become savages. Uh, but I want to argue, and it's not my argument, it's an argument now from many people, uh, that cooperation actually can emerge naturally on its own, based on our own selfish, self, uh, our own uh, self-interest, and without any central authority. Because it appears in animals, who, have no, who have no, certainly have no religion, and no ethics in the way we know it, but they, are still, they still cooperate. So, uh, this, this whole subject has a, has a long history, and the most famous person who came out for the selfish gene hypothesis is, is Hobbes. And, and he believed that cooperation cannot emerge without a central authority because nature is dominated by selfish individuals who compete on ruthless terms, and that life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, which is very sad that he believed this. Uh, and but so his conclusion was a strong government is necessary. Okay, but we see that there are still examples of cooperative behavior. So here is a group of meerkats in the Kalahari Desert sharing babysitting. You know, one set of cousins will sit and the parents will go out to gather food and then the parents will come back. You know that penguins do this too. You know, the, the father penguin uh, sits, puts, it, puts the egg on his, on his uh, feet while the mother goes off to feed. And just when the baby is about to hatch, the mother comes back and she has fed, so she's full of food. And then the baby hatches and then she keeps the baby on her foot and feeds the baby by regurgitating uh, her, whatever she has captured while the parent goes off to hunt. And in, in fact, they are so exhausted that um, 
what, quite often, this is a very strong selection pressure, that they are living in these awful climates, and, and they are at the edge of starvation by the time they, just, they have to start going out to get food. So parents do a lot for kids. Um, so here are Colobus monkeys sharing food. I don't know how related the, these are, but they're probably reasonably well related. Here are two different kinds of budgigars sharing fruit. And then just for a joke, you know, <laughs> there's a dog sharing his food with a baby. So um, what, what you learn from genetics and evolutionary theory is that just like successful gangsters, our genes have been competing and surviving for, a, for millions of years by competing with each other. And, and we are, we and all animals, are survival machines that have been created by our genes. And the genes manipulate us constantly. You might imagine that you are actually you have free will, but I want to convince you that in some cases you do not have free will. will. Um, of course, the preeminent quality you would expect from this relationship, where you know you are kind of manipulating somebody who is actually doing the real work, is that you have to be ruthlessly selfish. But um, this does not mean, I and mean, people misinterpret this to say, okay, so this, again you go back to the Hobbesian view that 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 ethics now, you have to impose ethics on top of society, otherwise society is doomed. And, but this does not tell, tell us that. This does not mean that our morality is or should be based on what genes do. Right? Because it, it, precisely because you have free will. And so genetics and evolution doesn't, don't tell you how you should behave. Uh, so p people usually make this error. And the, the way they make this error is that they, they do not distinguish between what is the truth and what should be the truth. So if I tell you something is true, then you say, oh yeah, that's how it should be. But you can change it by making choices. So science just tells you how things are and how you interpret them to inform what you do is up to you. So let me give you examples of selfishness. It is well known that black-headed gulls eat chicks from neighboring nests when the parents are away. And why is that? Because you get a free meal, you don't leave your nest unguarded, and the parent, you know, it's the parent's fault that the parent left. And the praying mantis female eats the male after mating. There you can see that the male has lost his head. <laughs> this is called the ultimate sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, penguins in the Antarctic push other penguins off the ice to test if seals are in the water. So, <laughs> okay, so there are also examples of altruism. For example, when worker bees sting honey, honey robbers, vital organs are torn out. You can see this, this person is trying to get honey and the bee just stung him and left part of its abdomen inside the, inside the sting. So the bee usually dies very soon after. <laughs> and ground nesting birds, they perform a distraction display. So when a predator like a fox approaches, uh, the bird pretends, you know, it holds out its wing and walks slowly away from the nest, pretending that it's hurt so that the fox will chase the bird and, and um, not, not see the nest, and not see the nestlings. And of course, at the last possible moment, it will fly off. <laughs> so this is, this is um, actually, it's not altruistic. It is altruistic in some sense, because there is a finite chance the fox will catch the bird and eat it. Um, and of course, there are examples of mimicry and deceit. So here's, for example, on the left-hand side is a, is a true frog, and on the right-hand side is a leaf, under, uh, beside which it can sit and not be visible. Uh, th this is a dead leaf uh, mantis. And you look, it, it looks like a dead leaf, so if it sits amongst leaves, you won't notice that it's there. This is an anglerfish. It looks horrendously awful, but what it does is it's, it goes inside the sand and only sticks out that little antenna that it has, and it glows, that antenna glows, <laughs> like a lure. So when fish come to eat it, it, it can snap the antenna into its mouth, downwards this way, and the poor fish is caught. So this is, this is again mimicry and deceit. This is a bee orchid on the right and the bee. And the bee thinks it's a female, or the male bee thinks it's a female bee and tries to, tries to mate with it. But in, the, in, in, in doing so, it pollinates the, the orchid. So, here's, here's, it's, so this is a cross-species uh, mimicry. If you see, you know, one is an insect and the other is, the other is a plant. Um, and leaf, so that, those are all fish. They look like leaves, but they're all fish. And this is a leaf insect. You can see this is one insect. It, it only sits on eucalyptus trees. 
And you can see that it's, uh, it looks exactly like a eucalyptus tree. Why do we still, there's a fallacy that people have about group altruism, that we, we as a group have some kind of ethical need to be altruistic. But this is wrong. And, and the reason it's wrong is that what we see in nature is that animals spend a lot of time and energy in reproduction and nurture. So most of the time when you see an animal, including humans, you see it in the process of nurturing. And so this is wrongly labeled by sociologists as perpetuation of the species, which is not the motivation for reproduction, but the consequence. So you are putting, you're switching cause and effect by doing this. And then it's a slight stretch of logic from there to deduce that the function of reproduction is to perpetuate the species. And that's what we all do. Of course, the final error is to conclude that animals behave in such a way as to perpetuate the species. And that's what all sociologists tell you, that we have morality because we want to perpetuate the species. So group dynamics is more important, that an animal will sacrifice itself for the benefit of the group. And they give a typical example, they give an example of bees, you know, who attack intruders, or ants who will commit suicide. Um, but of course, I, I will show you the proof in a little while. If, if such a group of altruists existed, there would also always be some guy in there who would refuse to make sacrifices, right? And the system is unstable to such a person because what happens is this minority will have better success, especially reproductive success. As far as evolution is concerned, the only thing that counts is reproductive success. So their progeny would inherit these selfish genes. And very quickly what would happen is uh, the rebels would outcompete the, the altruists. And so you would have an unstable system. I'll give you a better proof from game theory, which you will see soon. So the true origins of altruism are, of course, kinship recognition. All of you can look at someone and say, he's an Indian, but he's not an Indian. Okay, and the second thing is reciprocal benefits. You know, if, if I have something to give you, you have something to give me, then, of course, altruistic behavior can appear. Or every businessman knows this. But the second thing is expectation and certainty, either of reward or punishment. So, in that sense, the social system is, is useful and necessary. But also nurture. If you're brought up in an environment where you can trust people, right? if uh, most people you meet are trustworthy, then you expect the world to be this way. If you're brought up in a cruel, vicious world, then your reaction will always be cruel and vicious. And of course, on top of that, we have other institutions such as culture, language, heritage, religion, tradition, and so on. But now, and imprinting and education, right. So I, I, want to, I want to take you through a journey of how life actually evolved from what we know now from evolution and genetics. So uh, there's a very strong um, sense that the origin of life was probably a molecule like the RNA that exists now, which could make a copy of itself. People have made such molecules out of a mix of, of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, if you supply it with enough energy and, and you, you send enough currents to it. You can even make amino acids. And so let's call this thing a replicator, which can copy itself. And it doesn't have to be very elaborate. It can be very simple initially. But of course, two things happen. First, they make many copies of themselves. So there's lots of them. And then they mutate. Once in a while, they make the wrong copy. They put in the wrong thing. And and, and if the copying, if the error is also a replicator, then you will have many types of replic replicators. And then of course, they will fill up the resource that they have. And now, since the resource is finite, these replicators start to compete. Not compete in the sense that, that they are aware of what they're doing, but just that the efficiency with which you replicate is important now, which didn't used to be before. And the fidelity with which you replicate is also important. So then, of course, the f you, you would have all these scenarios in, that game theorists like to use, that the fitness of these set of replicators would depend on how long they lived, how fecund they were, which means how many copies they made, how accurate their replication was, and how reproductively successful they were, if they could produce lots of them. So this is the conceptual model of such an RNA replicator. It's not important what the, what the details are. You can see that you can, you can to harvest different uh, nucleotides from the environment and make a, a template, which is the complement, then the template separates, and then the temp template itself can be used to make the original replicator back. So the replicators made, made these, these copies, 
And then the types of replicators increased. There was competition. And eventually, the replicators became very complex. And the battles were probably took a long, long time, millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. The replicators then made, made walls out of molecules for each other, for, for themselves. And they lived inside these walls, which became even more elaborate because they needed to communicate to, 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 to copy themselves more efficiently. And these walls became cell walls, or nuclear walls. And more and more complex strategies were evolved until they, they created organisms like us, and, uh, or, or older organisms. So over four billion years that the Earth has been around, uh, life actually can be traced back to one and a half to two billion years. Four billion years is a huge amount of time. It's, it's hard to imagine how long it is, but it's an enormous time. Um, these, these replicators created a diversity of survival machines. We are one of them. And this shows you the tree of life. The replicator is down there somewhere. And all these intermediate forms are all different survival machines. Uh, and, and the survival machines became extremely elaborate and diverse. And of course, the replicators are immortal. They are your genes. They, they, are, they are inside all of us. And they swarm in us, safe. It's like you live in a house. Well, they live in a house too. They live in a huge house, which they manipulate uh, by remote control. And I want, so this sounds like a, like a science fiction story. But I want to convince you uh, of that it's true. Um, so, uh, but before I do that, l let me just make one more point. So we all, we all say, well, what about, what about free will? What about consciousness? Aren't we somehow special? Well, one. Uh, one way that consciousness may have appeared, so, so how, how, do, how do animals behave? They make a model of the world, right? Your senses give you input, and then you use the sensory input to make a model of how the world works. And then those of us who react in the right way survive better than those of us who do not react in the right way. Therefore, the replicators that are inside the people who react the right way are propagated, and replicators that do not react are not. So we, we simulate the world. Every day, when you wake up, you look around. Why, the, why do you know that you are in your room? Because you've been there before. There's a simulation program in you that is evoked, and you say, yeah, I know this. I know what this is. And you don't even do it consciously. It's just unconscious. But consciousness may have appeared when the brain simulation of the world includes a model of itself. So um, there's a book by uh, Sam Harris called End of Faith, in which there is a chapter which I would strongly recommend you read. What he says is that when a child is born, it's not aware of what's going on. It just gets sensory input, and it's not processing anything because it has no clue what the context is. But over time, it, it, the same inputs come over and over again. It sees the mother and feels warm and comforted. It sees, you know, if it's cold, it cries, and then the mother comes and there's comfort. So it, it, it learns by association of images from its senses with, with the consequences of these images on itself, on, it, on its senses, senses again. And at some point it realizes that this whole thing makes more sense if I am something, that I exist. And things are being done to me, that there is a sense of an ego, that there is me. And that makes the worldview simpler. You know, the simulation makes sense. That, yeah, so these are different entities and they are acting just like me and they're acting on me, and I, I can react to them. And then it starts to grab things, and, and then it sees that, yes, if I grab something, I can pull it closer. If I want something that I prefer, I can bring it in. So it builds a world's model of itself. And over time, this model replaces the original model, where you are not making a value judgment of the world. And that is our consciousness. So it's, we, are, we are so unconscious of our consciousness that it basically takes over. And that's the modern view of I mean, it's very sad for people who actually believe in the soul, but it makes much more sense for, from a scientific perspective than anything else. And so is the tyranny of the genes over? Can we move on? So I, I, I want to argue that the genes still remain the primary policy makers. And brains are only the executives. And they give us a single instruction. When the brains took over, the genes gave them a single overall instruction. Right? Do whatever you can to keep us alive. Make sure you make copies of yourself. So, 
for example, here's, here's an experiment that was done by someone. There's a disease that, that causes grubs to, to become bad. And there's a set of worker bees that can identify the bad grubs. They pull out the caps from the, from, from the nests in which the grubs are located, and they pull the grubs out and throw them in the garbage heap. So somebody did an experiment where they, they, they crossed uh, the bees that had this behavior, that had clean nests with bees that did not have this behavior, whose nests were polluted with the disease. And they found three types of bees. Ones that, that had the right behavior, they removed the infected nest, ones, ones that did not. And ones that they removed the caps, but they didn't throw out the grubs. Okay? So what this experimenter did is that he removed the caps himself amongst the crosses. And he found that one set of the ones that didn't do anything, they removed, they, from when the caps were removed, they threw out the grubs. So this tells you something very important. This tells you there are two, two genes, one for, for removing the cap and the other for removing the grub. And these things have co-evolved and you can actually, so then finally they identified where the genes were and they could manipulate them in any way you want. So really you are under, at least animals, you might say I'm not under any control at all except the control of my spouse or mother as the case may be but uh, okay so there's a way to there's a way to do mathematics and I want to just do a quick calculation um, so how do you define similar from the genes perspective similar just means when you recognize someone who says he looks like me or she looks like me uh, this is a cue that person probably carries the same set of genes okay so um, in, in population genetics or in anthropology that is, a, people define something called a kinship coefficient. How many, uh, what fraction of your chromosomes is shared? And it's one half to the power g, where g is some generational distance. But parental care is kin al altruism. You're doing this not for yourself, but because genes have imprinted you in such a way that you recognize your, your family from birth. The whole process of development is to do exactly this so that you feel more comfortable in your, in, with, your, with your own people. This is why there are divorces, but you know, you can't divorce your mother. You may want to, but you cannot. <laughs> but you can divorce your spouse, because there is really no genetic connection with you, unless, of course, you're inbred. So, but, so, but, but, but kin selection is not group selection. You're not selecting because it's for the good of the community. This is a fallacy. You're doing it for the good of your genes. It's a selfish thing that you're doing, which is good for you because it's good for the genes. So, for example, here, here's, a, here's an example. Suppose I find eight fruits, each of value six. So I can eat only three of them because I'm not that hungry. Okay, so, if, so should I eat three and not tell anybody? That's one, one option. So, or should I give one, should I eat two and give one, uh, two each to one brother, one cousin, and one stranger? Okay. So if I eat all just the three and not tell anyone, my score is 18, six times three. But if I, if I share two, I eat two, I give two to my brother, two to a cousin, and two to somebody unrelated, then the score is a little higher. So sometimes it is better to share. So you might say, well, but nobody does this calculation. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> nobody, who does this? But you do instinctively. So this is the, the title of my, the poster on, has this picture. So this is a famous problem. It was invented in 1950 uh, by two people here. And so imagine that you have two, two prisoners and you put them in different cells and you ask them to confess. And the rule is that they both confess, confess they go to jail for five years, yes, so they get a heavy sentence, sorry. If, if both don't confess, they get a light sentence. So if they both hold on, they get a light sentence. But if one confesses and the other one does not confess, sorry, if one who confesses goes free, and the other gets a heavy sentence, payoff of zero. So here's, here's, it's better to write it as a matrix. So imagine that these two prisoners are called Colin for column and Rose for Rose. Okay? And, and so what, so they have two choices. Either they confess, I'm not even using this green pointer. So either uh, Colin doesn't confess or it confesses. Either Rose doesn't confess or Rose confesses. And these are the payoffs. And I just made up these numbers. So now how do you analyze such a game? What should you do? Let's see what you should do. So if you, if you think 
like a selfish person, right? So, if for, so what Rose does says is, let's see what can happen if I do two things. I have two choices. Uh, I can either do this or I can do this. But Colin can do, if whatever I do, if, if Colin doesn't confess, then it's better for me to, to confess because I get five. If Colin confesses, then also it's better for me to, con to, to confess because I get one. So this reward is always bigger than this reward for Rose, whatever Colin does. If Colin does this, Rose prefers B. If Colin does this, Rose still prefers B. So Rose will choose B. But the same thing applies for Colin. So whatever Rose does, I should do B. But if both do B, they both end up not getting the best reward. They both lose. So rational selfish behavior gives a lower payoff. So why am I telling you all this? Because this exactly is the opposite of what I said before, that you all act in a selfish self-interest. The reason is that you don't play, typically you don't play this game once. You play this game many times. Right? Uh, if you know how many games you will play, then you will always choose the wrong thing. Why? Because imagine that you play 10 times. Well, you know that on the ninth time, you will choose B because you know the next time you're going to choose B. Because it's the last time you're going to play the game. And therefore, on the eighth time, you will also say, well, on the ninth time, I'm going to choose B for sure. So here also, I better choose B. So for any finite set of games, you will always choose B. And you get the worst possible outcome. But, but if the number of games you're playing is uncertain, things will change. And you can prove that if the probability to play one more game is P, the P is some number, then the strategy AA is stable if P is greater than half. Now, Think of this, when you play the game with your family, there are other issues involved, age. So that's why children lose interest in their parents, because they know they're not going to play the game anymore. To not many years left to play the game. But for their kids, they know that there are many years for the kids to play the game. So they pay more attention to kids. So there are subtleties involved here, which I'm not addressing. But, if, but generally, if the end of play is uncertain, then you should cooperate. Okay, but what happens in real practice? So it turns out, uh, there's a famous uh, example. Robert Axelrod, in 1984, um, he, he challenged people from sociology, economics, computer science, mathematics, to submit programs who would play prisoner's dilemma against each other. And they knew they were going to play for 200 games, and they could have any strategy you want. But you know, you submit the program, and then the programs play all other programs, you score them, for the average score across all these 200 games with each with each each other program, it turns out the winning strategy was tit for tat. Do unto others as they do unto you. So if you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. If you're not nice to me, that's it. Very simple. Then what he did was he told them about this. He said tit for tat is the best strategy. So why don't you write again, write new programs to beat tit for tat? So people submitted more programs. This time there were 62 programs were submitted and tit for tat won again. <laughs> Why is that? Because there were programs who could beat tit for tat, but they did worse with the other programs. And so, so he, he, he then looked at the, he sorted the programs by how uh, their success. And he found there were four properties of the programs that were successful. First of all, they were nice. They always start by cooperating. And they never defect first. They never cheat first. So they are friendly, right? Second, they were, they were retaliatory. If you defect, it will immediately punish you. <laughs> so they were strong, forgiving. But if you, after, after doing something bad, if you go back to good behavior, it's fine. I go back to good behavior too. So you're kind, you forgive. And fourth, you're clear. You don't mess things up. The pattern of play is consistent and easy to predict. So, uh, in bio biology, there is the notion of something called evolutionary stable strategies, which was invented by George, John Maynard Smith and D.R. Price. I only could find a picture of John Maynard Smith. So, it, I'll quickly go through this and then I'll stop. So, Im imagine that you have some resource which is worth 50, uh, 50 units. And there are, in the population, there are hawks who fight and there are doves who never fight. Okay? So, when hawks fight hawks, they, they, they get hurt. 
So they end up with, uh, with damage to each other, and the injury cost is minus 100. So if you add that to the resource and share it amongst the two hawks, they get, they get a payoff. If a hawk meets a hawk, the payoffs are minus 25, minus 25, equally. If a hawk meets a dove, the dove just gives in. So the hawk takes everything. Uh, conversely, when a hawk meets a dove, the hawk wins. When a dove meets a dove, there's a lot of posturing that goes on, you know. But, and so you lose energy from the posturing. So you, you have a wasted time cost of 20. I just made up these numbers. And, and so then you, you subtract that from 50 and you split the, you know, then basically randomly one of them wins. So if you, if you study these strategies, it turns out that if you, if you play a pure strategy, if you're only a dove or only a hawk, let's say a population of only of doves is, is unstable to hawks. Because if a hawk comes into the population of doves, the doves are busy posturing. The hawk, whenever he encounters someone, is more likely to encounter a dove because there are very few hawks. So he always win. So he always has a higher gain. So the number of hawks will grow. Conversely, if you have a population of hawks and you have a few doves, the doves will win. Why? Because they'll always lose with the hawks. But whenever they play against each other, they will share the resource. So they will grow. Right? Um, but if you don't play such a strategy, instead of that you play a combination strategy, it's evolutionarily stable. It, it can't, so what it means is that if you increase the number of hawks or doves, it will go back to equilibrium. And the strategy is be a hawk 7 out of 12 times, else be a dove. Right? For these particular numbers, it turns out that's a stable strategy. And I've drawn here the, the, what is called the payoff, the payoff of, of this game. But it turns out that if now bullies enter the population, then they overpower the doves. So a bully, what the bully does is it fights if the opponent does not fight back. Okay, so otherwise it runs away. So as soon as a bully meets a hawk, the bully will not fight. But if a bully meets a dove, then the bully will fight. And unfortunately, bullies will dominate doves, and doves will die out. Okay. But, of course, as every child knows, there is a strategy against bullies. You've met them all in school. And the strategy against bullies is that you can be a retaliator. And what's a retaliator? It behaves like a dove. So it's nice. However, if persistently attacks, it will attack with all its force. It will turn into a hawk. If that happens, you know, the bully will only bother you once. And then the bully will never bother you. It turns out this strategy destroys the bullies. <laughs> At least in this game. And so, of course, on top of this, you can have a bourgeois. There's a bourgeois strategy on top of this, which I don't want to go into. A bourgeois is somebody who's a hawk in his own territory and a dove in other people's territory. <laughs> but I, I hope I've convinced you that this subject is interesting enough that you want to work in it or at least read up on it. So let me give you a list of all books. So here's, here's the book, which is a famous book, which launched this whole field. It's by uh, somebody who's now become an advocate for, uh, for atheism, a um, very smart man named Richard Dawkins. And this book that I have here is by Matt Ridley, who is here. And then the, the uh, Robert Axelrod's book, where he played these computer games, is, is shown here. Now, you might wonder, why am I writing the names of these people and the, the date when they were born? Right, that's one reason. But the other is that my wife always complains when I go to the library and spend too much time, that I spend too much time with dead people. <laughs> <laughs> I want to convince her that these people are alive. I, the only reason this guy's uh, birth date is not given is that I couldn't find it on the web. But he's still alive, for sure. Uh, and, but one of, the, one of the pioneers of this field is W.D. Hamilton. Unfortunately, his, his papers are very mathematical, so hard to read. But all these other people have interpreted that. And finally, I would strongly recommend this book by Robert Trivers, who's a colleague of mine at Rutgers. It's a fantastic book. It, it's about self-deception. Why we, we must deceive ourselves to survive in the world. It's a fantastic, he's a, he's a very weird man. Very brilliant, but very weird. And, you know, it's wonderful to, to, to talk to such people because they, they really are off the deep edge somewhere else. Okay, well, that's the end. Thank you very much.